Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the DIM 400 section on musculoskeletal radiology. This section is going to be covering bone neoplasia, and I'm Dr. LaRue, and I'll be giving these lectures. So we immediately kick off with uh, the whole section on malignant bone neoplasms, and osteosarcoma is the most common one. Probably about 85% of bone tumors seen in large breed dogs are osteosarcomas, and they may be osteoblastic, so they form a lot of new bone, osteolytic, which are predominantly lytic, um, for example, the image on the left, or mixed, which means that there is new bone as well as lysis. There's a bimodal peak. Dogs at two years and at eight years are most commonly affected, as are heavier breeds um, or large breeds. The tumor usually occurs in the metaphysial region, and it's highly aggressive with early metastases to the lung. So by the time the neoplasm is detected in the bone on radiographs, there's a very good chance that it's already micrometastasized to the lungs, even if it's not immediately picked up on radiographs. So osteosarcoma affects four main sites, the proximal humerus, the distal radius, the distal femur, or the proximal tibia. So I always remember it as away from the elbow towards the knee but it can occur in any bone. So there are typical features of osteosarcoma and all of them are aggressive. So if you remember back to the initial lectures we had on the introduction to radiological interpretation, we looked at several things that indicate that a lesion is aggressive. And we'll be covering a few of these again. So there's often soft tissue swelling present, for example, in this image here. There's brush-like to sunburst periosteal reactions, and these lie on the more aggressive spectrum of the different types of periosteal reactions. Codman's triangle, which we'll get back to a little bit later again, is the more solid periosteal reaction that occurs um, on the diaphysial side of the lesion and is more benign. There can be amorphous bone. This is new bone that is sort of speckled and speculated within the soft tissue and not associated with the cortex and lysis is typically moth-eaten to permeative, and both of those are aggressive. The type of scalloping that occurs, as opposed to osteomyelitis, where the scalloping occurs from beneath the periosteum, the scalloping in neoplasia is from within the medulla, so it'll be endosteal. That is because the neoplasm usually originates within the medulla and then eats away from the inner margin of the cortex or the endosteal surface. Cortical spike formation occurs when there's a defect in the cortex, and it typically does form a pointed spike, and small to large cortical defects may be present, and sometimes it's so severe that it looks like large portions of the bone is absent. So on the left-hand image, it's an example of severe soft tissue swelling present over this humeral neoplasm, and there's a lot of periosteal new bone, ranging from thick brush-like to possibly even amorphous cordially over here. So the diagnosis here is an osteoblastic osteosarcoma. It's a typical location. And if you look at the degree of soft tissue swelling and the amount of new bone, this radiograph has become underexposed because the area um, is a lot more dense and a lot thicker. So if we look um, at the image on the right, there again is soft tissue swelling present. There is amorphous bone present with some thick um, brush-like periosteal reaction. A lot of it is actually quite irregular. There's multiple cortical defects. So there's areas where the cortex just appears to be completely absent with spike formation. For example, there's a spike and there's a spike and there's coalescing permeative lysis. So this is a mixed lytic and blastic osteosarcoma. So again, we just uh, revised the different types of periosteal reactions. We've covered this in more detail on the lecture in, of osteomyelitis. But um, just to remind you that the thick and thin brush-like periosteal reactions are more aggressive up to sunburst and amorphous new bone. And these are the, typically the ones that will be seen with neoplasia. All right, so here is an example again of a mis mixed lytic and blastic osteosarcoma. There's a thick brush-like periosteal reaction in certain areas with amorphous bone within the severe soft tissue swelling over here. 
So if you compare these images to what we looked at when we looked at osteomyelitis, you'll agree that this looks nothing like the osteomyelitis um, examples that we looked at. The periosteal reactions here are much more aggressive. There's much more lysis that is vis visible. And the thick brush-like reaction in osteomyelitis tends to be more regular um, and much more conservative. And in this case, it actually looks like the bone has just exploded. So coming back to um, Codman's triangle, this is just the solid periosteal reaction seen on the edge of an aggressive lesion. The reason for it is that um, the periosteum here is slowly elevated along with the rest of the pathology, but not as rapidly as the diseased bone. And that's why it has a little bit of a more benign appearance to it. But it's important not to judge the um, aggressiveness of the lesion based on that. You need to look at the whole picture over here. Okay, so here's another example that just shows a really nice um, Codman's triangle proximally. So it's on the diaphyseal side of the lesion over here. So these two examples of lysis um, just demonstrate the difference between them. Moth-eaten lysis tends to be larger lytic areas. In this case, they coalesce to form even larger ones versus permeative lysis, which is multiple little punctate lytic lesions. So on the left-hand image, what's also nice to see here is that there is endosteal scalloping. So the cortical defects or the erosion of the cortex comes from within the medulla versus from subperiosteally in osteomyelitis. The image on the right also demonstrates a pathological fracture that has occurred because the bone is weakened. In neither of these cases is there much of uh, a periosteal reaction. So both of these we'd rather call an osteolytic osteosarcoma. And if we compare these again to osteomyelitis, osteomyelitis tends to be a lot more blastic with new bone formation and periosteal reaction. And osteomyelitis does not have the endosteal scalloping. The slide over here again, um, the schematic image just shows that endosteal scalloping comes from the endosteal side. That's because the neoplasm is on the inside and it pushes out as it grows and it lyses the bone. And here's an example of cortical spike formation. That just occurs once the cortex has been eaten through from the inside and it forms little spikes. Here's another typical example of an osteosarcoma affecting the distal radius, which is a typical site. Again, there's some soft tissue swelling present. There is um, some poorly defined thick brush-like periosteal reaction over here. Some of it is starting to smooth over a little bit. Um, and there's moth-eaten lysis, which is coalescing. And there's very clear endosteal scalloping, for example, present up here. And here is some cortical spike formation. There's a defect in the cortex over there. So this, again, is very typical for osteosarcoma. Osteomyelitis would look nothing like this. Osteosarcoma can occur in other bones or other locations as well, not just those four typical sites. The distal tibia can be affected, as well as the proximal femur, for example. Um, on the left here, you can see severe soft tissue swelling. There's some amorphous bone, um, some thick brush-like periosteal reaction, and then there's extensive permeative lysis. Um, some places it looks a little bit moth-eaten, but it's probably just coalescing, and there's some cortex that's absent over here. In this case over here, there's a focus of thick brush-like periosteal reaction, um, and there's also extensive permeative lysis over here. Just compare that to the normal medulla over here, and you can see the very big difference between the two. Other less common sites, for example, the pelvis. Here's a radiolucent lesion over here, and there's a thick brush-like periosteal reaction medial to the acetabulum. And on the skull over here, over the frontal bones, there's a fine sunburst periosteal reaction present. Pathological fractures can occur secondary to osteosarcoma. 
So the fractures are obvious to see, but the more important thing to note is that the bone is abnormal. So there's moth eaten to permeative lysis over here. This bone has periosteal reaction over here. If this is the normal um, medulla of the ulna, just compare that to what this whole area looks like, and you'll notice that it's quite lytic. Osteosarcoma can also occur in small dogs. It's not as common. They tend to have more bizarre sites and bizarre behavior and appearance. And osteosarcoma in cats is also much less common. It's a less aggressive type of tumor. Flat bones are more commonly affected and it's got a better prognosis because metastasis is much later than in the dog. This is just an example of an osteosarcoma in a small breed dog. So you can, if we apply all those um, principles about what constitutes an aggressive bone lesion, here it almost looks like geographic lysis with a little bit of thinning and bulging of the cortex, but um, there is no periosteal reaction present. So looking at this, it looks like it might be only a mildly aggressive lesion, but remember in the small breed dog, the osteosarcomas are quite different. Right, so this is an important slide that compares osteomyelitis and osteosarcoma. In some cases, it might be very difficult to determine what the underlying pathology is. And in those cases, a biopsy would need to be done. A biopsy probably is needed for all confirmation. But by applying some of these, one will be able to determine one from the other in several cases. So osteomyelitis can affect any age. Hematogenous is more young dogs. Um, whereas osteosarcoma has got the bimodal distribution of two years and eight years. Any breed can be affected by, osteosarcoma, uh, by osteomyelitis, whereas osteosarcoma tends to be the larger breeds. Osteomyelitis may be polyostotic if it's hematogenous, so multiple bones affected, or monostotic more so if it is traumatic. Osteosarcoma is typically monostotic unless it has metastasized to other bones and then it becomes polyostotic. Osteomyelitis can cross bones and joints, whereas osteosarcoma does not. Both osteomyelitis and osteosarcoma tend to affect, affect the metaphysis. For osteomyelitis, it's more in young animals because of that sluggish blood supply, whereas in older animals, the diaphysis will be affected if it is hematogenous. The periosteal reaction for osteomyelitis tends to be more um, extensive and more palisading or thick brush-like. Versus osteosarcoma, it's much more irregular, speculate to sunburst, even amorphous bone. Both share moth eaten to permeative lysis, but osteomyelitis may have a better defined transition zone with some sclerosis as the body is trying to wall off the infection, whereas osteosarcoma, the transition can be quite indistinct. Cortical scalloping from osteomyelitis is subperiosteal due to the exudate accumulation. And osteosarcoma is endosteal because of the um, neoplasm pressing from the inside and resulting in lysis. Osteomyelitis tends to be more productive, so much more periosteal reaction versus osteosarcoma that is more destructive, even though it can have a productive component superimposed over it. Osteomyelitis tends to be slower to change on radiographs, whereas osteosarcoma is much more aggressive. So there's much more rapid change on follow-up radiographs. Osteomyelitis can form sequestra, cloaca, and involucrum, whereas osteosarcoma does not. So chondrosarcoma is much less common. This is um, the second most common malignant bone neoplasm that we're going to discuss, but affects only 10% or is only 10% of those. It affects older dogs and typically more the flat bones, such as the pelvis. Again, it doesn't cross joints or affect adjacent bones. It grows much slower and the metastasis is much later. So local into the lung and so a better prognosis. Because it is a cartilage type of tumor and cartilage is loosened on radiographs, we'll see a, li a loose a lytic lesion and the ballooning cortex. So the cortex will get pushed out. There will be minimal periosteal reaction. And as the cartilage um, can undergo mineralization in this tumor, one starts to see C rings or donuts, which I'll demonstrate on the next slide. For example, this is a large lytic lesion, typical of a chondrosarcoma affecting the pelvis. And if you look carefully, there's several areas where there's little round sclerotic regions. 
They look like little donuts or rings. And that's typically for cartilage ossification. In the case on the right, the lesion is much more subtle. There's this large radiolucent area on the ischial table with bulging of the overlying cortex, which might be very subtle, but if you compare it to the opposite side, you can see that there is definitely a lesion. Fibrosarcoma is the last um, aggressive lesion we'll be looking at, and that's only 5% of neoplasms. Again, older dogs are affected. It's often near joints. This one can cross joints or affect adjacent bones, which the other two tumors don't. It's got medium growth speed and metastases via the lymph nodes rather than the lungs. So this is a typical fibrosarcoma. It's a very large lytic area. The bone is completely lysed. There's no periosteal reaction. The bone that we see over here is just remnant cortex. There's no sclerosis. There's minimal soft tissue if it comes from the bone, or there can be a lot of soft tissue swelling if it is a soft tissue origin. So it can have two different origins. Then there are several benign bone neoplasms that occur in dogs. They're not very common. The first one we look at is an osteoma occurs in younger dogs and affects the skull mainly. And it's got a different appearance. So this lesion over here looks like trabeculated bone. It doesn't look like sunburst or thick periosteal bone. So therefore we can say that it's not aggressive or not that aggressive. An osteoclastoma or giant cell tumor occurs after physial closure in the dog. It affects the epiphysis and the metaphysis typically and the most common sites are the ulna, the radius, and the tibia. So it consists of expansile geographic lysis with cortical thinning. So if we go back and apply the principles of what makes a bone lesion aggressive or not, if we look at geographic lysis and a little bit of cortical thinning, we'll see that this is a very mildly aggressive lesion. Also, there's no periosteal reaction um, present, and we can add that as well. Multiple cartilaginous exostosis um, is the name we give to multiple lesions. Osteochondroma is the word we use when we talk about a single lesion. So the two examples would be osteochondromas. These are neoplasms that typically occur in immature animals, and the lesion or the growth or the, the tumor starts, um, stops growing at maturity of the animal. They consist of extra osseous cartilage islands, so initially they might be radiolucent and with time they will mineralize. And the theory behind this type of a tumor is that cartilage from the physis herniates at 90 degrees to the bone and then eventually it mineralizes. And that's why commonly we see this just in the metaphysial area adjacent to the physis. It can be pedunculated or sessile, um, and I, I've said it a uh, couple comes from the metaphysis most commonly. Metastatic bone neoplasia can also occur. It's quite rare. Um, the most common type of tumors that result in this are mammary carcinomas, prostatic carcinomas, or hemangiosarcomas. Although osteosarcoma can also metastasize and lymphoma can also affect bone. It's usually diaphysial because the cancer cells um, if metastasizing via the blood will enter the nutrient artery. It can be polyostotic, so many bones affected, and there generally is minimal to no periosteal reaction. Now here is an example of um, one patient that has got polyostotic bone involvement. So there's multiple areas here in the tibia, as well as both femurs that are lytic, as well as um, the carpal bones over here. Tarsal bones, my bad. Infiltrating bone neoplasms can also affect the bone. So, for example, here is a large soft tissue swelling affecting um, digit 2, mainly around P3. And there is P3 is completely lysed almost, just some remnant bone left. There's a bit of a periosteal reaction on the side here, which could be due to pulling on the periosteum from the swelling or possibly involvement on some of the collateral ligaments. So neoplasia of the nails or the nail beds or the digits are very tricky to diagnose and differentiate from infection because they can look very similar. 
Neoplasia, though, tends to be more lytic, um, but both of them can also affect multiple toes. I would say osteomyelitis or pododermatitis is more likely to involve multiple toes, but certain neoplasms like osteosarcoma has been described to affect multiple toes. Here's just another example of a neoplasm. P3 here, most of it is destroyed with marked soft tissue swelling in this area. The splayed toe, mediolateral, also helps to visualize this as you split the toes away from each other and they're not superimposed. So multiple types of neoplasia can affect the digits. Nail bed squamous cell carcinoma is probably the most common, but malignant melanoma, mast cell tumor, hemangiosarcoma, fibrosarcoma, liposarcoma, and um, not on my list, but osteosarcoma can also primarily affect the bone and pododermatitis and fungal infection of the nail bed would be differentials in this case. But bottom line for digital tumors is that a biopsy is needed. So we just come at the end to a summary comparing the different types of malignant neoplasia that are most commonly seen. Chondrosarcoma and fibrosarcoma are older dogs, whereas osteosarcoma is bimodal and can occur in younger dogs. Osteosarcomas, metaphyses of the long bones, chondrosarcoma, the flat bones, such as um, the skull and the pelvis, and fibrosarcoma tends to be closer to the joints. Osteosarcoma won't cross the joint. Chondrosarcoma is uncommon, and fibrosarcoma can. The adjacent bones are rarely affected in chondrosarcoma, um, almost never in osteosarcoma, but fibrosarcoma breaks that rule and can affect adjacent bones. Of these, osteosarcoma is the most aggressive with the fastest growth speed, whereas the other two demonstrate slower growth. Osteosarcoma, again, has got the most aggressive type of metastasis, so it's very early to the lungs, whereas chondrosarcoma and fibrosarcoma are later. Chondrosarcoma to the lungs, fibrosarcoma to the lymph nodes. Right, so that is, brings us to the end of the lecture on musculoskeletal neoplasia.